Studying the book of Daniel has been marvelous, actually. <laughs> um, and in these last eight chapters, we have learned so many things. But mainly God has allowed us to see the, the life of an extraordinary man. In the first six chapters, we were able to very clearly see the life of, of Daniel. We saw his faithfulness to God. On, on, a, on a personal level, I follow Daniel very closely. <laughs> um, he's a person that, that has very high standards uh, spiritually. So it's a, a Bible character that I follow very closely. And, and if, when you read Daniel, and starting from chapter 1, I mean, just from the get-go, it, it's as if Daniel didn't sin. It's as if Daniel was holy. It's as if Daniel was perfect. Obviously, he was not perfect, because the only one perfect is God. No one's perfect. He was a sinner, just like you and me, because we are all sinners. We are all born with what's called a sin nature. Some of you are like, huh? really? <laughs> yes, everyone has what's called a sin nature. Anyone that's in the flesh <laughs> that is breathing has what it's called in, in theological terms, a sinful nature. The Apostle Paul said it best in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, when he said, for the wages of sin is death, because that's the result of of our sin. Sin brings us death. Again, we have all sinned. We're all in the same boat. All of us. And sin is something that we have to deal with. And if we're not careful, sin can ruin our lives. And we can't allow that because sin is lethal. But the question is, how do, Pastor, how do you combat sin? How, how do you combat a sin nature that is within us? How, how do you combat sin nature that it's in our, in our flesh? How do you do that? That's a good question. That's a question that we should constantly be asking. How do we combat sin? How can we be winners? And this is the problem. I'm sure Daniel constantly asked this question. If you recall, Daniel was brought in as a, as a slave. He was a slave. He was a kid. He was probably in his teens, his 13, 14 years when he came to Babylon. He was a slave. Babylon had destroyed their land. I mean, it was a very bad situation for Israel but if we really look at their past, Israel had disobeyed God. The people of Israel had started worshiping other idols. And God had given them opportunity after opportunity to come back to him. Because the reality is that God is patient. That is one of the greatest attributes of God. And I thank the Lord for that. I thank God that he is patient because when I look inside of me, I, I praise God that, that he has mercy. But God had given them so many opportunities, and God is patient. I love how the Apostle Paul puts it, how he, but yet the Apostle Peter, how he explains God's patience. And, and you can see that in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. This is what he says. Peter. Out of all people, Peter, he says this. He says, the Lord is, is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but he is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. I, lo I love when he says that all should reach repentance. And if you know anything about the apostle Peter, you'll know that, that Jesus had Lots of patience with him. He had lots of patience with, with, with Pete. <laughs> and, and you know something? If God can forgive Peter, I mean, Peter 
He was one of the, the one of the rough guys, as far as, as far as the group of the twelve disciples. And if God can forgive Peter, you know something? He can forgive us too. If if Jesus can forgive Peter, he can forgive you. He can forgive me. I mean, he can just thank the Lord for that, right? That God is a, a forgiving God. So this is what Daniel 9 is about. It's about forgiveness. If you recall, the first half of the book talks about Daniel's life. But the first half prepares us for the second half of the book of Daniel. That is why the book of Daniel is so unique. I love the book of Daniel. It's always been a favorite of mine. It's been a favorite book. He's one of my favorite characters in, in the Bible. Last week I told you that the first six chapters are written in Aramaic. Aramaic is the language that Jesus spoke. But then something very peculiar starting in chapter 7 happens. Starting from chapter 7, Daniel changes language on us. Instead of it being Aramaic, he now writes from chapter 7 on to the chapter 12. It's all in Hebrew. In other words, it's as if he is, and he is, he's directing himself to the people of Israel. And it starts to get exciting. Daniel 7 gets exciting. Daniel 8, from, from here on, it's, it's exciting because it's all prophetic. It's all prophecy. Daniel 7, if you recall, and Daniel 8, if you recall, talks to us about the Antichrist. I'm going to remember that, okay? It talks to us about the future because if there's anyone who knows the future, it's God. And it's something that we've really talked about in these last couple of weeks. There's no one else that can tell us about the future. Not the palm readers, not psychics, none of those people. We just need to be careful with that as well. Again, the only one who can tell us the future is God. And he does it through his word, the word of God. Amen? So it, it's exciting because we're able to know what's going to happen at the end. If there's Anyone that knows, it's us. We know what happens in, in the future. Because God knows the future. And that's why this is exciting. That's why Daniel is an exciting book, especially what's going to come here in the next couple of Sundays. Do not miss the next couple of Sundays. Because it's, it's really going to get good as far as the future and, and prophecy. It's going to be great. But right now, something happens. Something happens in, in the beginning of chapter 9 because Daniel basically, in essence, stops talking about the prophetic. Daniel stops talking about the future for just a moment. If, if you really read these first verses from verses chapter 9, verses 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 13, 14, it's almost like Daniel just stops with, with the prophecy. And what he does, he starts to pray. It's so important. Prayer is important. In church, we pray because it's important. That's one of the things that we do. That's something that we're supposed to do in, in our lives. We're supposed to pray. And it has to be real. It can't be like, you know, some prayers that we, right before eating, you know, your food, we're like, amen. You know, I know some people that do that. I've seen them. <laughs> They've done it in front of me. <laughs> it's just like a quick, you know, that, the ones that do pray for, for, for their food, but the ones that, you know, there's some that don't. But <laughs> they do it so quick. I'm like, whoa, what, what did you say? <laughs> you know. So Daniel here in chapter 9, he, he, he stops with the prophetic. He, he stops with, with, with the future. He stops talking to us about the future because he starts to pray. And that prayer is, is, is a confession. When's the last time you confessed before God your sin? When's the last time you, you, you came before God and said, Lord, I, 
I, I really messed up here. I said something I shouldn't have said. I did something that I shouldn't have done. When's the last time you did that? That you came before the Lord. And here we see that Daniel does that. And it's a, and it's a very personal prayer. And what we see here that Daniel is, is, is showing repentance. He is acknowledging his sin and he is asking for forgiveness. But there's something else that you need to know about this prayer. Because there's a reason why Daniel is praying. Because remember I told you that, that Israel had disobeyed God? Remember that? I just said that just a few minutes ago. The reason that they were all in this predicament of being enslaved was because of their disobedience. The reason why they were in captivity was because of their disobedience. Now, Israel had been in captivity up to now, chapter 9, for 70 years. Again, uh, Daniel is he is old. He is probably over 80 years old. God had punished Israel for 70 years. They were to be captive for 70 years. But good news, chapter 9 it had been lifted. In chapter 9, Israel was no longer captive. The 70 years of captivity had been lifted. They were about to go free, but there's a concern. And this is what Daniel, this is the reason why Daniel is praying, because there's a concern. The concern was that, that Israel might not have, might, might have uh, changed their ways. It could be that Israel was still the same even before the 70-year punishment. The concern was that Israel would continue with a cold heart. The concern was that Israel would not come close to God. I'm sure Daniel was thinking that God would give them more punishment. And that's why he, he stops dead in his tracks. Again, we're said, chapter 7 starts off with, with prophecy. Chapter 8 continues with prophecy. But in chapter 9, it's like everything stops. And there's a concern. The concern was that there might be more punishment. So Daniel starts to pray. And he starts to pray fervently. He starts to pray with all that he's got. And you know something? I love his prayer. And the reason I love his prayer and why it's different than, than, than many other prayers and other religions, the reason why I love his prayer is because he includes himself along with Israel. Now, mind you that, that Daniel really had no fault in any of it. Daniel had no fault in Israel's sin. In fact, he wasn't even there when Israel sinned. He wasn't there when Israel decided to worship other idols. He wasn't there. But I, but I love the fact that throughout this chapter 9, these verses, he includes himself in other words, he's not pointing fingers. He's not saying, see that? God, they're bad people. Yeah, go ahead, punish them. Do your thing, God. You don't see any of that. You don't read any of that in, in, in these verses. He's not pointing fingers because, again, it's so easy to do this. It's so easy to say, hey, pastor, I'm not the problem. She's the problem in a marriage. No, pastor, don't listen to him because he's the problem. And then, boom, 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 and there's like, you know, there's a list. <laughs> I'm going to stop there. <laughs> and the problem is that no one is willing to take ownership of their problems. No one's, no one's willing to take ownership of their mistakes. 
And I think that's one of the biggest problems in our society is that we like to point fingers and, no, they're at fault. No, you're at fault and all this kind of thing. Daniel had no fault in any of the problems of Israel. Nonetheless, we're going to see here in a moment that he includes himself as part of the problem when he, he really isn't. In this prayer, this, this way that he's praying, he's consistent throughout pretty much chapter 9. I mean, go, go, go to your Bible for a moment, chapter 9. This is not going to be on the screen. So if you don't have a Bible, you can pick up a Bible in, in, in your pew. So I, I want you to really read this for yourself. I want you to, to really confirm what I'm going to tell you for yourself. Like chapter 9, verse 5. This is what he says. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled. And this is, again, Daniel, he's saying this. He's really not at fault with anything. But nonetheless, he's, he's saying he's including himself. He says, we have sinned and done wrong uh, and done wrong and, and acted wickedly and rebelled. Verse 6, we have not listened. Verse 8, now he says, to us, O Lord, belongs open shame, for we have rebelled against him. Verse 10, and we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. And if you continue down up to verses 14, 15, 16, he continues in that same pattern. He is making himself as part of the problem. And I think that that's so awesome. I think that that's so awesome that he's not pointing the fingers and he's saying, no, the, the congregation, Lord, they're at fault. They're wicked. No, he says, Lord, we, we have sinned against you. We have not obeyed you. Daniel includes himself with Israel. He's making himself part of the problem. This is so admirable. Now go to verse 9. I, 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 wanna, I want you to read this. Verse 9 through 11. It says, To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. He continues that pattern. I have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants and the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to, be, to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us. Because we have sinned against him. You see that? He continues that, that pattern. He continues including himself. I mean, he has no fault in any of this. He is not the reason why they're in captivity. He is not the reason why they have been in captivity for 70 years. He's not. He really isn't. So what Daniel's doing here is called humility. Daniel was humble. But he knew that that captivity was about to end. And again, that was his concern. His concern was, okay, we're, we're, guys, we're, we're about to, to, to get, get to that finish line, all right? But we, we, we need to make sure that we get there and that we get the prize. In essence, that's what this chapter, the beginning of this chapter is all about, getting to that finish line and making sure that, that we don't continue in captivity, that we don't continue in jail, that we go free. So these verses, he is reminding them why they got there in the first place. I mean, that he does. Because the fact that people tend to forget their past problems is what gets them in trouble again. Amen? That's the truth. So he wanted to remind them, guys, I just want to make sure that I'm firm in telling you that I'm clear in what I'm saying to you that don't do the same things you did in the, ba in the past that got you in trouble. Don't do them again. Daniel wanted to make sure that the people knew that they needed to truly repent. 
And that, that requires that, that the person have a, a, has a, a broken and contrite heart. Because there really needs to be true repentance. Or else it, it's not going to work. You're going to continue in this, in this vicious cycle. You might be okay for a little bit, but bam, you're back at it again. You're, you're in prison. You're in captivity. So Daniel is saying here, there needs to be true repentance. So I want to share with you two thoughts of true repentance today. Today's message is, is going to be somewhat short. And I know what you think, yay! <laughs> Only because we have our new members class. I'm so excited about that. I'm always excited when we have the opportunity to, to bring on board new, new members to our church. But I, I, I do want to share with you two thoughts of true repentance and um, if you want to write them down somewhere or just remember them, that's fine. And I, I ask that, what I'm about to tell you, that it can be part of your just everyday prayers. That you can have it present in your mind and, and just know that, that if you do these things, that what the Bible says, not me, what the Bible says, that there's going to be a blessing in your, in your life. Because God will bless you. Now, I'm not saying monetarily. I'm, maybe, maybe, I don't know. But basically, I'm saying, yeah, God will bless you in, with your family and your health and things like that. I truly believe that. So here's the first thought. There must be passion in true repentance. You hear that? There has to be a passion. You, you must really want to, to, to do it. You must really want to have that true repentance. And you need to go after it with all that you have. There has to be passion. So that means that there must be honesty in true repentance. In other words, you must be passionate about turning away from your sin. You, you, your passion must be for real about not doing the things that you did wrong in the past. And I know that that sometimes is a problem, that we can't let go of our past. And that the things that we did wrong in our past, it seems like sometimes it comes back and it haunts us. And we keep on doing it and it becomes a vicious cycle, as I was saying before, and, and, and that's what we need to break. So, that, so therefore, we need to be passionate about wanting to stop that sin in our life. We need to say, Lord, help me. I need to break this chain. I need to break this sin in my life. I can't continue with this. I need to stop the alcohol. I need to stop the, the drinking and the smoking and, and, all, and, and the cursing and, and all these things that hinder me from coming close to you, Lord, that needs to be something passionate about us, that we come to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I've tried AA, I've tried this, I've tried that, I've tried all these humanly things possible, but I have not been able to break that chain. But we have to be passionate about it, just like other things that you're passionate about. You name it. I'm sure, you know, we're all passionate about something in our life. But we need to be passionate about true repentance. We have to be. I love Daniel because what he teaches us is that we can't do anything in our strength. So that's something that we need to really make sure that we understand that. This is not something that, that we do because, oh, okay, I'll try it, you know, and it becomes part of your to-do list. And then you put it on your refrigerator, your to-do list, and you have all these things on your, 
refrigerator and you, you go and you do exercise and you come back and, you know, and, and all of that and it becomes part of your, your routine. No, this is something that, that we have to go to the Lord. We have to go to God because you are not going to be able to do it in your strength. And that's what Daniel is saying. He's saying, Israel, you have to rely on the Lord. You have to rely on God. We can't do this on our own strength. And I love Daniel because this is what he's teaching us. Verse 3 says that we, are need, that we need to turn to, to his face. That we need to turn to God. I looked up verse 3 in, in, the, in the Hebrew. And it uses, for, for the Lord God, it uses the word Adonai. Adonai is, is one of the names of God. And what it means in the Hebrew, it means sovereign master. Which actually what he's really trying to say here is that true repentance includes submitting to the sovereign God. That's what Adonai therefore means. It means submitting to our master. So in order for us to have true passion, there has to be a submittal to God with all the things that we do in life. We have to. And it has to be sincere. Our repentance needs to be sincere. Secondly, there is humility in true Repentance. There needs to be humility in our lives. Simple as that. We have to be humble. Now, Daniel did not do any of the wicked things that Israel had done. Daniel never, that, that we can read about, in all the book of Daniel, never did he worship the idols. And let me tell you, he was in a place that worshipped lots of idols. He could have you know, submitted to Nebuchadnezzar, to his co-workers, and said, all right, guys, I'm, I, I, just calm down. I, I, I'll, I will worship a couple of your idols, and I'll continue worshiping my idol too, okay? I'll go halfway with you guys. And, and you know, we don't see Daniel negotiating like some people do. And they'll negotiate in their life. Okay, yeah, uh, I'll, you know, I'll still continue doing the worldly things, but guess what? I'll, 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 I'll come to church, though. So, God, I'll meet you halfway. You know, I'll still do all these things that you don't like, but I'll just go halfway with you. I'll, I'll come to church. As if that's going to be Okay, is that if that's going to, you know, suffice for God. But you know something? God is, he doesn't share his glory with anyone. I just want to tell you that. Either you're in or you're not. And, and that's what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that he is a jealous God. We must, we must understand this. So Daniel, he understood that he, although he didn't do any of those things that Israel had done, he wasn't at fault for the punishment that God had given them as far as being in captivity for 70 years. He wasn't at fault. It wasn't, it wasn't his fault. Nonetheless, he understood that he was still a sinner because, church, we are all sinners. All of us. Every single one of us here, we're all sinners. There's no one here that is holier than now. Not even the pastor of this church. We are all sinners. Church, brothers and sisters, those that are visiting today, we are all in the same boat as far as being sinners. Now, the only difference... The only difference between us and the world is that we are sinners saved by grace. We are sinners saved by what Jesus did on the cross. Praise God for that. That's what makes us different. 
But we cannot be like that one Pharisee that didn't recognize his sin. Luke 18, 11. Check this out. So this guy, right, the Pharisee, he's praying. He's in church. Now, this is the other side of this coin. People that, that, that believe that they're so spiritual, that believe that they're so holier than now. These are the brimstone and fire people. And this is what he says. He says this, Luke 18, 11. This makes me laugh, by the way. This is just so funny. Luke 8 to the 11. He says, the Pharisee standing by himself, although saying he couldn't stand alongside the sinners, he couldn't sit on the, on the same side of the people in the pews, he's by himself. <laughs> standing by himself, he prayed. He's praying. God, I thank you that I'm not like those guys over there. See that? I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like them. Those extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this other guy, the tax collector. That's that's bad. And I thank the Lord that there's no one like here in our church. Thank the Lord for that. I thank God for that. <laughs> We've been having some problems, actually. <laughs> because we must be humble in our repentance. In his prayer, ever do you see, do you read that Daniel felt that he was holier than thou, that he felt that he was holier than the rest of the, of, of the people of Israel. That's why I love the part that he includes himself in all these things. Lord, we have sinned. We have not repented. We deserve the punishment. I love that. That he's inclusive And it's just such a great lesson for me personally. It should be a great lesson for our leaders of our church. Nonetheless, Daniel did warn them about their, their sin. He says, guys, you got to be careful here, though. you got to be careful. Our God is holy. We're not holy, but God is holy. And he was firm in his, in his warning. He was. But I love it because he does it in love. Again, he was so humble. Because he knew that there was about to be a new day. How many can praise God for new beginnings? Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord for new beginnings. Hi, Pastor Manny here. We thank you so much for tuning in. It's a true blessing for us. If you like what you heard today, please go right ahead and download the message or share it with others. But we also invite you to come to our church at Boynton Beach. God bless you all.